20 by 20 is five squares. It'd be a lot easier if the ground wasn't frozen. Hey guys, welcome back. So a few weeks ago I just finished this pasture fencing out here and in today's video I thought we would cover all of everybody's questions and concerns and try to explain a few things on why I did the things I the way I did them. Um, I'd also cover the area that we fenced in, how big it is, uh, how long the fence was, and the total cost of the project. So we'll try to answer all of those questions. Also try to cover some of the, the tools and the cost of the tools um, that I had to, to put this fence in. So before we get started with that, in the last video I posted on the pasture fencing when I was hanging the gate, several people asked me what I did with the culvert that went underneath the fence line and what did I do to secure that to keep predators from crawling through the culvert and getting inside the pasture? Well, honestly, I totally forgot all about it. It completely slipped my mind. So thank you guys. Several people brought that up. Several people remembered that. And I appreciate you guys bringing that up. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to cover that culvert up. So I've took a, a piece of a uh, stock panel, a sheep and goat stock panel. So it's got a four inch square, pretty tiny opening. It's the same as what our fencing is here on the side. And I'm going to put that right on the inlet side of the culvert, inside of our pasture. And I'm going to put it right up against there. And what I've done is I've taken some treated pieces of lumber. And I've made basically a big wooden stake out of it. And I have a slot that I've, I've sawed in that. So that stock panel is going to fit in the, the slot on each side. I'm going to put one on each side. I'm going to pound these in the ground. And then I've got one that's going to fit over the top. So I'm, I'm going to totally encapsulate that stock panel with wood bracing all the way around it to help keep that in place. Now the problem I'm running into today, of course, is the ground is frozen and I can't get these wooden stakes to pound into the ground. So I'm gonna have to wait a few days for it to warm up and then I'll come back out here and I'll finish this project up and that, that culvert will be secure. Now I put the stock panel on the inlet side. Reason being is if, if dirt and debris and sticks and everything wash down, it'll all build up right here where I can just reach down, I can clean it out, and I can get the water to flow again. If I would have put it on the outlet side, all that dirt and debris would have built up inside of the pipe, inside of the culvert, and it would have been a lot harder to clean out. So that's why I put it on the inlet side. So that's what I'm gonna do with the culvert. Uh, hopefully I'll get that done this weekend when it warms up. So let's go ahead and cover the one that everybody wants to know. How long is the fence? Uh, how big of an area did we fence in and and what did it end up costing? Now one thing I will say is sometimes when you're when you're filming stuff, uh, the way it appears in the videos, it appears that it's a lot bigger of an area than it is. And this is not that big of an area that we fenced in. So I want to explain that right now because uh, you're probably going to be shocked at how small of an area this was. So before we started, we basically just had the barnyard fenced in. And then we fenced in this pasture and we put a fence that's a divider fence and we broke this into a small pasture and a big pasture. So it was a perimeter fence and one subdividing fence. So the total length of all that fence was around 900 feet of sheep and goat fencing, uh, field fencing. And um, keep in mind we did keep posts every eight feet and most of it we had a wooden post every 24 of those feet. Uh, so we did have uh, a, probably a more expensive post cost in, in the cost of the fence. So the total cost of the fencing um, was $2,837, so a little under $3,000. Now, uh, woven wire fence, and probably the way I spaced out my, my posts and everything, made this a fairly expensive fence to put in. Now, when we fenced all this in, the total square foot area that's fenced in here 
is 1.3 acres. That's it, 1.3 acres. It's not a very big area, like I said. Um, the most of our acreage on our property is farm fields uh, that we can eventually take over and we could eventually turn those into pastures. Like right here in front of me, I've, we've got a 12 acre farm field just right here in front of me, uh, which would be a nice big pasture if we ever wanted to one day. But anyway, that was the cost of the fence, a little under $3,000. And being 1.3 acres, you gotta understand that we're gonna end up getting two cows to put in here. This is definitely not gonna be enough forage for two cows, I understand that. Um, so we will have to supplement, feed them with hay throughout the year or some other type of food because there will not be enough forage to raise two cows out here. So we will have to feed our cows to be able to, to raise them out. But at least we have a fenced in area to raise them in. So the next question that I got a lot of was some places where I built my fence, I did a single brace and some places I did a double brace. So why did I do that? So the reason I did that is on woven wire fence, a lot of the stuff I read, it said if you were about 165 feet or greater, you wanna do a double fence brace. So that's what I based that off of. So anywhere I was basically over 150 feet, I went ahead and put in a double brace. Now, another reason to do that is, is the brace is the foundation of the fence. It's what it's built off of, and you want your foundation to be as strong as possible. So building that double brace on, on these longer runs, I, I definitely feel like we built a better fence using a double brace. So if you're running high tensile fence instead of woven wire, what they say is to base it off the number of line wires you have. And um, I think they say if it's seven wires or greater, on a high tensile fence, you should do a double brace. Well, this sheep and goat fencing has a lot of line wires in it. There's 13 line wires in the sheep and goat fencing. Um, so based on that, uh, also that's another good reason why I did double braces is because there is a lot of line wires in here to stretch uh, when we stretch the fence. So throughout the whole fence build, I, had, I, I got comments all the time on putting barbed wire at the bottom of the fence. Now. I know a lot of people don't like barbed wire, and I personally don't like it that much either, but it serves a purpose at the bottom of the fence. One, it's the closest one to the ground, and if one of them rusts out because it's laying on the ground, it's a barbed wire, it'll be easy to replace, and uh, it also keeps animals from crawling under the fence. Now the other reason is I put it two inches above the ground, and then the field fencing ends up being two, two more inches above that. So my field fencing is sitting that far off the ground, so there's really a lot less chance of that field fencing rusting out from the ground or it just kind of keeps it up off the ground and the field fencing should last longer. And I know a lot of people said they've never seen anybody put barbed wire on the bottom before and I have seen lots of other people put barbed wire on the bottom under the field fence. I think it's mostly common for small livestock. Uh, so smaller livestock are more prone for predators and you don't want them crawling under the fence, but also small livestock you don't want to get out either. So it also prevents your livestock from crawling under the fence as well. If this was only like for cattle, you wouldn't put a barbed wire on the bottom if it was just for cattle. This is, it's on the bottom because we have a lot of small livestock inside of our fence. So when I installed this farm gate, I had a lot of comments on the way I installed it. So the, the first one was, um, when I, when I put this two-way gate latch on here, I had to chisel that post out because I, I didn't have enough spacing there. So I had to chisel that out to put that, that latch on there. And I had a lot of people say, well, why don't you just thread the hinges in on this side over here? Well, I did do that. They are threaded in all the way. It may not showed up on the video that way uh, because of the way it gets edited, but I threaded that in all the way and that hinge uh, of the gate is basically right against the wood. Uh, there's really hardly any light that even shines through between them. So it is threaded in all the way over there. Um, I did do that first before I went to the time of chiseling out that post. Um, the other comment was people said they would not have put the hinges on this side. They would have put the hinges on the other side. And the reason being is that fence is going that direction and the weight of the gate is this direction. So they think uh, the weight of the gate would lean the post over time and, and then get where the the gate eventually drags the ground. So um, I will say that that is a concern that I understand that, but the way that this two-way gate latch works that you probably, I didn't explain in the video, is that when that gate latch pin comes in, 
it actually lifts up on that pin and it rests on the latch. So it's actually supporting the gate on that side. So the gate is being, when it's latched in the latch position, the gate is being held up on this side by the latch and it's being held up over here by the hinges. So as long as it's, it's latched, it, the weight's evenly distributed and that post will not lean over. So I, I feel comfortable with the way that I have it mounted. So one of the other comments I got was when I hung the gate, I put it on backwards. So it has this fencing, that wire mesh fencing that's on the front of that gate. That is welded to this side of the fence, my side of the fence, or the gate. And they said that that wire mesh fencing should have been on the inside of the pasture and it would have made a nice flat surface so the animals couldn't climb it. So the way it's on right now, of course, there's a ledge on the bottom pipe that the animals can get and step on the gate. Uh, and they're probably right. I mean, I'm sure I got it on backwards. The reason I put it on the way I did is because the hinges were already on that side. So that's the way I hung it. Um, so I understand the concern with that. If the animals do step on this fence because they can, and uh, if that becomes an issue, I can easily take the hinges off and I can swip, uh, flip everything around and, and put the gate on the other way. But uh, we'll wait and see what happens uh, with, with this. But yes, apparently I did put it on backwards. So when I built this fence, I used a lot of gripples. I used them to build the brace wires here and to be able to tighten and tension them up. I used them to splice fence. I was very happy with the gripples. I thought it made everything easier. I thought it made it went faster. Now I've had a lot of people voice concerns that they think that maybe these will loosen up over time or maybe that water could get inside of them and it would freeze and then they would loosen up because of the freezing and thawing. Um, or maybe the ice would just bust them. Um, I haven't seen any of that. It hasn't been a very cold winter so far, but we'll just have to wait and, and see over time whether these continue to work well. But as far as assembly and everything went, it did make everything easier, I think. So this here is the corner brace that we built to stretch the fence around it at about a 45 degree angle. And <laughs> this part of the fence, I think I had a lot of people that weren't happy with me putting a corner brace in here and stretching around it. Um, a lot of people disagreed with this. Now so far the brace has not moved. It's actually the top of it is still leaning this way right now. So the brace is still looks good, but the fence itself is the loosest fence that I have. And I do think that it caused a lot of drag to try to stretch that fence around that post. And it made it harder to stretch the fence tight. So, if I was to do this over, I'm not, a, I'm not sure I would do this again. I will say that. I might just go ahead and make this two pulls if I was to do it again because I, I am, I'm not really happy with the way the fence is loose in this area. So we'll find out over time whether this brace fails or not, but I do think that I'm going to end up coming back and trying to do something to tighten this fence back up. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the fencing tools that I bought for this project. So the first one I've, I'm going to show you is the fencing stretcher board. I bought this at Ken Cove Fence. It's a four foot, five wedge stretcher board. And I know a lot of people use like a two by six and some bolts and they wedge uh, the fence together. I've done the same thing myself. Um, this stretcher board only cost me $110 and it was free shipping. So in the end, I, I, I don't think it was that much to pay for a stretcher board and it held every line wire uh, incredibly well and it's just really easy to be able to at least uh, hook up to with a come along and stretch it. So yeah, $110 free shipping. Um, yeah, I just went ahead and bought it. I think it was well worth it, especially if I'm gonna be stretching fence uh, every year for the next few years as I keep fencing in new areas. So to stretch the barbed wire fence and to stretch the fence using the stretcher board, I just used uh, two ton come alongs. I already had a couple of them uh, that I use when I cut down trees to help pull a tree in a certain direction. So I already had these, but you can pick them up for about 40 bucks. So the next tool is the gripple torque tool. Um, it, the gripple just fits in the top of it and then you can tighten the wires up against it. It fits a few different size of gripples in the tool up here at the top. And um, it is required if you're going to use gripples, you have to have some kind of a torque tool. Now, the gripples themselves are about $1.25 a piece. Um, so when you're just using one of them on a brace, uh, that's not very expensive. But if you use to splice a whole fence, that's 13 of them. So it does get a little bit pricey. Um, but I do like the way 
it has a torque setting here at the bottom and you dial it up just like a, a torque wrench and you can set the torque of your wire and set how tight it is. So I, I really do like uh, the fact and how easy it is to tighten wire up with this thing. Now one other thing you might need is a release tool for a gripple. This is what, the, what this is right here. This is a little bitty release tool and that fits inside of a gripple and you can release the spring tension or the lock in there. You can release it so you can slide it. Now I will say that you can only release it if there's no tension on it. You're not going to get it to release if it's tight. Um, but um, these do come in handy when you want to reposition a gripple having one of these release tools. So I did end up buying a high tensile crimping tool. Um, this was $55 for this crimping tool and it fits four different high tensile splices. Now I only use this I think like one time. I didn't use it very often. Most of the time I always just use a gripple. Uh, but I went ahead and bought this so that I would have the ability to do a high tensile crimp and I just haven't, I just didn't end up using it very much so far. So one other tool I bought was these Nipex Cobalt miniature bolt cutters and these are really tough little cutters and I use those to cut high tensile wire. The only place I, I had true high tensile wire in this fence was the brace wire. Um, but if I, if I would have cut these with like a regular set of channel lock lineman pliers, it would have ruined the tooth in here. That, that wire is so uh, hard that it would have dented the, the, the cutting tooth in a regular set of pliers. So that's why I ended up buying these Nipex um, Cobalt miniature bolt cutters. I think these are like an 8 inch bolt cutter and these were like around $55 as well. So other tools that I would carry with me, one was lineman's pliers. Um, I've got three different sizes of these and these are about nine and a half, ten 10 inches long. Those are the ones I carried on me most of the time. And then I do have fencing pliers. A lot of people ask me, do you have fencing pliers? Because they didn't ever see me use them. Most of the time I just use these to pull staples. I just use the hook here to, to pull staples. Um, they can do lots of things, you know, I mean, you can hold staples, pull staples, you can cut wire, you can twist wire, you can do a lot of things with fencing pliers. Um, but where they shine, in my, in my opinion, where they shine is pulling staples. So let's go back to the, the total cost of this fence. I did buy three rolls of fencing that were 330 foot long, and I had a partial roll before I began. So those three rolls of fencing were around $700. Um, so the majority of the cost of the fence was the posts. It was the the posts, the the brace posts, the metal T posts, and I put I put posts every eight feet. The whole 900 feet, every every eight feet, there's a post. So um, that's where over two thirds of the cost of this fence was the posts and the braces. So you can build this cheaper and be able to do this cheaper, but um, the way I did it, I you, people will probably argue that I overbuilt it, putting my post spacing that close together, but um, I'm, I'm fairly confident that it will last uh, longer, hopefully. Let's cross our fingers. But uh, I think you can build this fence cheaper if you, if you do make your own posts and uh, or try to use used posts instead. So overall, on the pasture fence, I'm happy with the way it looks overall. Now, my first two stretches of fence, I just built fence braces and then stretched my fence and put T-posts in between. And those two stretches of fence don't look as good. I, I will say that. T-posts are not the greatest in trying to hold your fence straight or, uh, or up and down to follow the terrain. I did, I did like it a lot better where I put a wooden post every 24 feet because a wooden post is way more secure to staple your fence to and to hold your fence to. And that is something I will continue to do. Um, when I build my next fences, I will put a wooden post probably every 24 feet. It's more work. It costs more but it looks a lot better in the end, and I think it's just a lot better uh, straighter fence when I'm done. Well, I think that covers most of the questions, comments, and concerns that you know people voiced during the whole building process of this fence. Um, but when it's all done and said, I'm pretty happy with the fencing that we have installed here. Um, I'm not saying this is the way you should install it or this is the right way. It's just the way I did it, and most of that was based off of research that I did. I did a lot of reading. I read a lot of different fencing manuals, uh, ones that were based off of governments, uh, fencing manufacturers, and um, like universities and stuff like that. So I did a lot of reading. There's a lot of differences. There's a lot of opinions out there. Um, and 
you know, I just I just chose what I thought was best. And um, I think along the way, as I did this, I've changed some things up as I've built the fence. And I think I've I've learned quite a bit along the whole way. The whole thing was a huge learning experience. And and uh, I'm by no means a fencing expert by the time this is over with. I still have a lot to learn. And I'm sure there's still a lot of better ways to do things than the way I do it. But anyway, I think that is it for today's video, guys. I hope you have a great day. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.